Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to the program. It's Saturday morning and we're coming to you live from our Sunning Hill studios right here in Johannesburg. This is ITV Networks. Great to be with you. And you know the drill. We're with you till 10 o'clock this morning. And as always, the lines will be open. We're happy to take your calls. Coming up on the show this morning, we're going to be talking about blindness and vision impairment with a visitor all the way from down under and that of course is Australia. He is Bashir Ibrahim and we'll get to him in a minute or two. We're also going to be talking to Sawit, to women who have made a huge difference at grassroots level and we'll be wrapping up with something beautiful and sublime. The beautiful voice of Samiha Issa. She'll be here live to share some of her nasheeds with us and very especially a beautiful beautiful nasheed related to Eid ul Adha. So all of that on the show and we do hope we'll be hearing from you. Now coming to the first interview of the morning with our guest from Australia, Bashir Ibrahim. He's here to talk to us about vision impairment and blindness. Now it is also known that about 285 million people around the globe suffer from some form of vision impairment impairment and 39 million of those people are blind and in South Africa it is said that between 5 to 10 people who are blind are not literate in Braille. So the question that pops into our minds is what does the future look like that for them? absolutely dark and possibly hopeless. So let's talk about um, this disability blindness, just how it impacts and what are the things that can be done to better the lives of people with any form of vision impairment. Bashir Ibrahim, salamu alaikum, welcome to the program. Wa alaikum salam. Lovely to have you here. Good to be here. Yeah. Are you enjoying our country? I, I am, it's a little chilly, but but it's not too bad. Okay, you are a ex-South African. Be you, you left the country. You, you migrated many, sure. many years ago. Yes, yes. I was born in Ladysmith, Natal, and uh, my parents and brother and sister went to Australia in 1969. Yeah. Okay, so you firmly entrenched down under, but today we're going to be talking about something that's very, very close to your heart. We're going to be talking about people with low vision or vision impairment and people who are also totally blind. Now, how have you become involved and how, why are you so passionate about this issue? I mean, I've read your bio and I was blown away. Okay, it, 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 it's, a, it's a calling and um, I've been fortunate enough to, <coughs> excuse me, fortunate enough to have the opportunity to, to work with so many people, both professionally and clients and families and so on about the life and losing your vision is something that we we you know it's hard to understand sight people that. do take it for granted you're right and it is very hard for us to understand what a world of darkness is like or being locked in a world of darkness and it's also one of the things is that that we take for granted the gift of sight so Allah's given us this this amazing means of looking at the world and understanding and things so the you know the soul the the window the window to the soul is your eyes oh absolutely but it's your brain that is actually seeing so you know looking after your eyes looking after your health is very important but there are some circumstances where people have no choice where disease or hereditary factors come in and they lose their sight as a result of accident injury and other things and so how does that impact upon your life so making a difference and assisting people to go through that process. It's an ongoing process, as you can imagine, but I like to think of it that if you think about how it would impact losing your vision tomorrow oh. on your life, what you would do, think of the simple things, getting up, dressing, showering, making breakfast, walking down the street, crossing a street, 
you, you can't drive anymore. So these factors, how can we improve the lives of people who have lost their sight, who are losing their sight, or who maybe in the future will lose their sight as a result of some um, disease or process that's going on in their life. So it's about learning for young children who are born vision impaired and blind, as opposed to you know, older adults losing their sight later on in life, who've seen for many years, but who are now um, having difficulty doing their daily living tasks and so, so on. Frightening right? thought, mm -hmm. uh, absolutely frightening thought. But before we get into the heart of the matter, tell us about your studies. And off air, I asked you uh, about your passion for working and trying to assist and make a difference to people who are visually impaired. Um, you indicated no one in your family, uh, you know, have an impairment, a vision impairment. But I always say that when you are passionate about something, someone along life's journey has touched your life sure. in um, pushing you in this direction. So tell us that little story and also about your studies, because I haven't heard about this area of study, not in South Africa at least. Okay. I haven't heard about it. So that probably is something that is offered all around the world. It might be offered in South Africa, but I'm not aware of it. Sure, sure. I grew up with a, a, my, one of my best friends, Haroon, and he was born blind, totally blind, uh, from birth. And we grew up together. We met when we were about three or four years of age, so very soon when we moved to Australia. And so we grew up, and he was the eldest of, of six siblings. And, you know, his parents and, you know, we all interacted. And he, we, we would do everything that kids do. Got, got into trouble, we were naughty, <laughs> we did climb trees and things like that. But he's grown up since... Um, you know, as he was growing up through high school and so on, he, he used the white cane and then all of a sudden he was learning braille and then computers and so on. He's a computer programmer now. He writes apps for Apple. He does, um, he, he's a motor mechanic and so on. So I think subconsciously that, um, that had an inkling into to what I was going to be doing later on. And then mum, my mother, found this um, new course that was offered. So it was a small advert to come and try this new course at the university. It was a degree in disability studies, habilitation and rehabilitation. And the major was orientation and mobility. So that's working directly with people who are blind and vision impaired to become independent with their mobility technology and to daily living skills and so on. And you know, that leads into vocational educational options and so on, and life skills as well. Mm -hmm. So that's where the, the transition from a friend who is totally blind and learning and growing up with him as, as normal. Uh, yeah, it was Harun, he's my friend. You might have to... And you didn't see that disability. You just no. accepted him for this whole person. Sadly, um, children, little children, even adults, are very marginalised when they have any form of disability. And I commend you for looking past his blindness. I think that Australian society is such that it's, it's, a, it's actually, despite what you read in the newspapers or see on the TV about the, <laughs> the crackpots, it, it is actually a very egalitarian and, and a very um, humanitarian society. Socially responsible. Very, very. Mm -hmm. And human rights is, is, is very, very important. Okay? Mm -hmm. So understanding, inclusion, access, all these things are taken very seriously, and, but they're put into practice. They're maintained, they're developed, opportunities are provided for people with disabilities and so on. Unfortunately, around the world, the disability or the impairment becomes a handicap. By definition, the handicap is external to the individual. It's something that's imposed upon the individual by societal beliefs, prejudices. Um, you know, someone in a wheelchair getting to a building, there's no ramp. So you say, come in the front door, to everyone else, but they have to go out the back and come in via, for wheelchair access. So that's not accessible. So you know these principles need to be put into practice if they're to mean anything. So this idea that uh, an individual has the right to education, to um, community participation, to be part of society and, and not apart from society is very important. I know that you travel up and down to South Africa because you still have family members here. What have you picked up? What is your sense of the support structures in place for visually impaired people in South Africa as compared to Australia? It's, it's, it's without being critical, there, there, there are gaps, significant gaps. But the most important thing is that uh, fortunately the 
family unit or that support within, um, you know, not the nuclear family, but the extended family is still evident. So there are some um, safeguards and, and a little bit more balance in, in terms of that. So that's what's probably giving people more hope than anything else. Right? So what happens is we need to bring that information, that awareness services together with the family and the extended family so that we can explore the ideas of independence. So independence means different things to different people. In uh, you know a, an extended family or a society where the relatives look after the person with a disability, you know, from taking them around, doing things for them and so on, is different to independence in Australia, where you have very little choice um, in many instances because you don't have an extended family. The nuclear family is a mother, father, couple of kids. And so, you know, the extended family is more disjointed. And so individuals are living by themselves. They're living longer, they're living alone. They need to be able to do things and be independent in terms of doing their own washing, cleaning, cooking, shopping, um, walking around, traveling, you know, all those sort of things, going to school, university. And so that, out of necessity, has become part of the, the service development where we need to support those individuals in a society where there's less support from an extended family and community participation. So for, you know, there are many positives here that we can work on, but then we can also bring capacity, we can bring support to the family who then need a break and also who need support themselves in order to you know to to, to promote that independence and in okay let's go for our first ad break i'm talking to bashir ibrahim he's here from australia talking about uh, the passion of his work which is trying to make a difference in people's lives people with um, um, obviously people who are totally blind and people who are visually blind and I think I'm more than certain the idea is to try and connect up with perhaps people like the South African Council for the Blind and other such organizations and try and share some of his expertise, expertise and knowledge so that we here in South Africa can also try and up our game and support uh, people with vision impairments. Stay with us, lines are open throughout the show. Welcome back. Uh, Bashir Ibrahim is our first guest. He's a visitor from Australia talking to us about visually impaired and blind people. He has a degree in that line of work in Australia. I'm not even I'm not even certain if such causes are available here in South Africa. And I think we here should be waking up to that reality, not only for visually impaired people, but people with any or any um, and every type of disability, if we have uh, the type of professionals that can help them get their lives back on track, then just imagine the possibilities in South Africa for all people. Bashiri, you presented a paper in Canada a couple of years ago, and it had specifically to do with guide dogs, and they're absolutely integral to the life and uh, really the well-being of a blind person. Tell us about that and tell us about that area of your work. Sure. The, the paper was a joint paper with a colleague of mine from the UK and it was specifically about the use of dog guides, seeing eye dogs, guide dogs, uh, by blind Muslims around the world. So that was specifically about the myths, the, um, the prejudices and, and the misunderstandings about using a dog guide for your independent mobility. So that was the, the focus of the paper and that was in, in uh, Toronto, in Canada. How well was it received? And I'd also like you to share some of those myths with us. Sure, it was a plenary session. So there, there would have been about 500 delegates in the audience, excuse me, who, who came to that and it was very well received. So since then, I've presented that same paper or adaptations and advances uh, three times. So at, at different conferences and so on as plenary sessions. And some of the myths that we talk about is um, that the dog is unclean, that you know, it's not permissible. That's the Islam, biggest issue, isn't it? And, and so on. And so we, we, you know, there are many schools of thought. Yeah? However, the bottom line is that 10 to 20% of blind people around the world, and particularly in Western developed countries, only about 10 to 20% of the total blind population actually use dog guides. It's a very specialised area that either an individual is ready for 
and prepared and has the responsibility to undertake, whereas the majority of people will use white canes. But it's an option for those who use it, and it's a wonderful form of companionship. But and we talked about the nuclear family and so on, people living by themselves. So, and yeah. let me just interrupt you here. Despite the fact that we talk about nuclear families and extended families, sure. even that is breaking down in South Africa. The whole system around extended families because of the um, disband disbanding of apartheid, people are now moving into the suburbs, they're moving far away from um, you know, their immediate Family. families, extended families. So those ties are also being diluted sure. uh, because of the nature of the way where we work and where we play and where we live. Um, and that being said, uh, it, it makes it very difficult to depend on your extent, extended family for support, meaning that people with any form of disability are largely now having to fend for themselves. And they're very, very dependent on um, organisations like TIBA and other such organisations for support, all types of support. Sure. So that's also breaking down yeah, for definitely. us. Yeah, I mean, that, the trend is the nuclear mm. family is the trend. Uh, because people are moving for work, they're also, you know, the, maybe both um, husband and wife are working themselves, so there's no one at home and so on. So that, that again, is um, the, the trend around the world. So that, the, the notion of being able to fend for yourself and do those basic independent living tasks confidently, safely and, and appropriately within your goal set is, is very important. So the time now is to develop these things. Not after someone is struggling, they're, they're, they're depressed, they're, you know, they've reached the bottom of where you can get to. Yeah? So, and so the guide dog not only helps, <coughs> helps the blind person, the visually impaired person, helps them around, but they're also a great companion. Absolutely. And one of the things you've got to understand, and the, the public needs to understand, is that these dogs are working dogs. In Islam, a working dog, a hunting dog, a guard dog, to guard your family, your property, is permissible. The dog guide is also a working dog. They're actually bred to work, to lead, to guide someone through the streets, to avoid obstacles, to, to get to destinations and so on. So that's the purpose of the dog. It's not a pet. Yeah? When the dog is off leash at home and relaxing, then it's a pet and it's a family member and so on. But when it's working and the harness is on, it's actually got a job to do and it's trained. So the dog doesn't toilet, it doesn't lick and jump around and do things that other dogs do. And so that, you know, people need to understand that it has a purpose. It will sit by the user's feet in public transport, under the seat, between the legs there or beside them, you know, so it doesn't get its paws stood on from the other pedestrians and, and passengers. But it's concentrating. So it's actually doing work for a living. And it's with that individual. So we have to remember the purpose of the dog, what it's for. They're highly trained. They toilet on command. They, they don't just anywhere. And the individual takes that responsibility of grooming, keeping the dog clean and so on before they go out. And then when they get home, they keep the dog immaculate and things like that. The dog can sleep in a specific area. It toilets in a specific area. So these are all controlled and the person learns these things. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand that the, the, There's the dog a huge guide. place yes. in the life of a blind person Absolutely. for a guide dog. And it's safety as well. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Let's go back to Braille. Um, frightening statistics, only possibly up to 10% of people in South Africa are Braille literate. What does the scenario look like globally and how disadvantaged are people who blind people who haven't been taught um, uh, this form of communication? Well, I mean, that's an unfortunate statistic and it's, it's, it's a terrible one because Braille is a language in itself. It is a very important language for people who are blind and vision impaired. And in fact, <coughs> my, my wife Fatima has actually learnt Braille oh, in wow. Australia and so she's, a, she's actually learnt to teach grade one and grade two Braille. Oh, that's which is, amazing. Which is excellent. So she's, she's got so the So she's also in that line she, of work. Well, she's going to overtake me soon. So, <laughs> so, Wonderful. But the idea behind Braille is understanding that it is a language of communication. Madrasa, and it's an international language, it's not different from country to international country. International Braille, the unified Braille code is now in place. Mm -hmm. So that was to bring all the Braille from all over the world together so that you can communicate apples and apples, oranges and oranges. Right, right? like for so, like. Absolutely. So that is, that, that, that's a, a great development. But it is a language for an individual who needs to communicate in many different forms. Now the access to Braille 
is in many different forms as well. So we talked about technology earlier. Now, I wondered if technology is going to overtake this form of communication. Not at all, because technology is actually working with this form of communication because you can get Braille keyboards for your computer. Oh, of course. And still maintain of course. that. Yeah? When you send an email, it, it, like if I use Braille, I send a, uh, an email to you, it would be in print for you. And then right. coming back, it'll be in Braille for me. Of course. So the technology has been used to, to make sure that the connections uh, are appropriate. So this is about reminding people that Braille is a very important language for young children to learn in school. Touch typing is very important as well. So if you're learning Braille, you, you might as well learn touch typing because when you use a screen reader and computer program, uh, which like JAWS or Zoom text or that sort of thing, you want to be able to um, use the keys without having to push every button to find where you're going. So those two come hand in hand. Now Braille is, again, portable. You can use it on a stylus, but then you can also use it on a computer. And even on an uh, iPad, <coughs> there are a number of programs that you can enter your information using the Braille keyboard. Let's just digress <coughs> here, but then focus on your wife, Fatima. Sure. Uh, did she come from a teaching background? No, no. Fatima is a businesswoman. So she's okay. In her she's own also right. ex South African. Gee, yeah, right. she's from Newcastle. Yeah. Why did she go this route? I'm, I'm so fascinated that she's now teaching Braille to grade ones and grade two. She obviously had to go on a course for that. Yes, she learnt at the Queensland Braille Writing Association, which is a voluntary organisation, not for profit in Australia, who I've had many um, years of contact with. And Fatima. Um, contacted them, did the course and has established, and she's volunteering for them as well, and has established a good rapport with them in terms of, um, you know, the communication literacy and so on. So she's got a passion for that. She's actually quite very good at that, better than me. Okay, pity I didn't know that I could have dragged yeah, into the studio as well. She she's sitting out that. in the lounge. <laughs> okay, so um, Braille is here to stay. And yes. um, for people watching us this morning who have a loved one um, or even a child who is visually impaired, would you say as soon as possible, try and get the child or your loved one? And I, sh I should imagine age doesn't matter. So even if you're a much older person, an adult, and you didn't have the exposure to Braille in your early years, sure. Um, that you should still go and learn Braille. Absolutely. I mean, the, the thing about I'm too old, and my fingers aren't sensitive enough, you might have diabetic retinopathy or diabetes with the peripheral neuropathy. I mean, and, and so sensitivity is a bit dull in your fingertips and toes and things like that. You know, age isn't a barrier, yeah, or, or those impediments. It's about your passion to learn, your pers perseverance. I mean, I worked with a, a gentleman 25 years ago who was a farmer in rural Victoria in, in Australia. And his tractor rolled over, he had a farm, and crushed him, severe head injuries. Oh. Yeah, they didn't think he'd walk and talk and all those things again. And he learned Braille and fluently. Absolutely, I mean, he had horrific injuries and mobility around his local area. We taught him and he, he travels, walks miles and miles every day. You know, so it's about drive, it's about the opportunity but the opportunity is the big thing. Do you have access to that, that learning, that curriculum? You can do Braille by distance, believe it or not. Oh, wow. So, you know, again, technology, we can harness it. We can use it in many different ways. We can have Fatima, my wife, could Skype you and then she could teach you. Yeah. And so, yeah, there are lots so of different we, ways. So we could have that <coughs> a tool available in South Africa via Skype. Yeah, so we could hook up with Fatima in Australia yes. and then expose ourselves or our children to that modality. Definitely. And, and even the, the work that Fatima and I are doing in terms of in South Africa, <coughs> there will be opportunities for, for people to Skype us. And we can, again, with Tiba and Madrasa Anur, we, we have connections with them and so we're supporting them and they're supporting us and we can work together and slowly we can start um, providing, a, uh, you know, some independence and train people here and work with the other organisations that are doing a wonderful job, but they're overwhelmed. Right. And so, you know, bringing um, more resources and learning and capacity, capacity building and uh, enhancement and empowerment, and that, that, that's what it's about. You mentioned Madresa Anur, that's the Madresa in Peter Maritzburg. Yes, it is, yes. um, I think it's the only Madresa uh, Muslim run organisation for blind children and blind people, am I correct? I believe it is, yes. So, Alhamdulillah, they're doing marvellous work, and I'm so pleased to hear that you're working closely with them. Yes. What else are you here uh, to do in South Africa? I know you mean, mentioned um, Tiba. 
Yes. Uh, uh, you, you, you're working closely with him. What about the Council, the South African Council for Blind People? Because I'm more than certain there's lots of expertise, or perhaps the Department of Education, that you can share with us, or we can form some form of a partnership with you. Sure. I think your expertise is sorely needed here in South Africa. We're, we're Fatima and I are exploring the options and through connections with yourself and uh, T-Bar and Madrasa Anur, we hope to build those networks and establish those partnerships and linkages. And so that's, that's the mission at the moment um, in this trip. Um, we will be coming here because we, we want to visit family. It's a great place to visit and so on. But um, you know, there's a lot of work that we can do. We're working. Um, we're about to to work with the optometrist in in Newcastle, Faisal, who's offered some space and things, and talk with his staff and so on about low vision, <clears throat> and then it, within their practice, um, look at the network that they have. So by talking, you know, from small things, big things grow. So we can work with him. In, in, inshallah, get introduction to. Um, other optometrists start working to the orthoptist and then the ophthalmologist and then look at occupational therapists and, and slowly build into the mm -hmm. educational sphere as well. So the, the, you know, this is about growing the, the, the network and, and, and working in where we can help, contribute and add value. Because we don't Absolutely. want to, you know, we, it's got to be So positive. you're doing your social responsibility but as well, inshallah. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned ophthalmologists. Please do get in touch with uh, Dr. Aziz Valiella. Okay. Um, he's a well-known um, ophthalmologist in, in, in South Africa and works, well, the community or what most people do consult with him. Sure. So maybe, you know, something can come of that meeting as well. But let's look at the issue around um, low vision or vision impairment as opposed to blindness and people who are very short-sighted to have any form of uh, visual disabilities how do they distinguish I'm in this category sure. I'm now possibly termed as being visually disabled or impaired mm -hmm. the the spectrum of blindness All right. can you just hold sure. that let's take a call and then we'll respond okay. to that salam alaikum to our caller welcome to the show I have a friend in Durban that is blind and she doesn't have any way that she can go to. No one comes to visit her. There's no organize, Islamic organization organized in Durban. And the only thing that she is able to do at the moment is to use the telephone. And uh, the, the, her family has given her that uh, privilege to use the phone whenever she feels like. And that's all she has. Oh, shame. That's terrible, which means that's her only link to the outside world. Yes, it's the telephone. And occasionally, if a friend helps her to go out and do a little shopping or whatever. But there is nothing constructive in Durban, in the Durban area. Okay, um, let's see what our visitor can um, uh, tell us about perhaps some form of assistance or support for your friend. Shukran very much for your call. Shukran, yes. Salam. Shukran to him also for coming to, to talk about the people that are having problems with their sight. May Allah reward him. Amen. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. Okay, you're a visitor here. I'm, I'm sure you're not too familiar with the infrastructure in all around South Africa, but with your contacts in Ladysmith, Newcastle, etc., uh, perhaps you can find out or point the woman in the right direction, or perhaps ask her to contact one of your contacts in yeah, that part of the world. Def definitely. Um, it's about, and one of the, the projects we're doing here is finding out what is available and, and then where the gaps are. And so that, that, that work is going to hopefully complement what we're wanting to achieve. So um, we have, a, I can think of a couple of contacts that, that Fatima and I met at Tiba at the AGM last mm -hmm. weekend. And there's a, a lady there who's a mobility, orientation mobility instructor, who would be a great start in terms of that assessment. So one of the crucial things that we need to do is w the initial assessment or interview is very important. Because when you're talking with an individual, it's about their goals, their aspirations, not what, what, what I think they should be doing or the family member thinks that they should be doing or shouldn't be doing. It's about, oh, well, what would you like to do and them expressing their need? Because motivation comes from what your goals are and so understanding what it is that you would like to be independent with and, and receive assistance with and to do. 
and then maintain those skills and so on, and then grow them. So that's where the important thing is to look at that initial needs assessment and see what, what resources are then available. So it could be mobility, um, providing her with some training in using the, the white cane, for instance. Um, and people think, oh, it's just a white stick. Well, it's actually not. The techniques that people use with the cane are very well grounded in, in theory and practice from both um, Europe and Australia and the US and you know in terms of where it came about was from those people who were blinded through war and injury and so the systematic ways of navigating walking around knowing where you're going to step Next so what I'm hearing yeah. is that mobility and awareness is crucial as far as blind or visually impaired people are concerned. And just, you still need to respond to my sure. yeah. earlier question, but um, what I do want to say to the sister who called in is I would um, suggest that you get in touch with the South African Council for Blind People. They have offices throughout the country. So get in touch with them and inshallah they would be able to assist or give your contact details or get put your friend in touch with a social worker. I don't believe that there aren't any support groups in Durban. There has to be someone. Durban is a major centre, so please get in touch with the South African Council for Blind People, or you can get in touch with TIBA. They're based in Lanasia, and they would be able to refer you on. Sure. That's the best piece of advice I can give you. Would you like to add something as well? Absolutely. TIBA, Faranaz Waja is the social worker there. And so if... if Faranaz Waja. Right yes. So okay, there contacts, you go. If she contacts Faranaz, then she can then put her onto the, the caller onto um, the local Wonderful. services. Wonderful. Okay. So my question about how will I know that I'm, um, you know, technically or, you yes, know, I'm yes. technically um, classified as a blind or a visually impaired person? Sure. So when you, when you get your eyes tested uh, by an ophthalmologist, an eye specialist, a doctor, or an optometrist, a professional trained in... Uh, vision assessment and, and so on diagnosis there is a, a spectrum of vision right normal, of normal vision right so <laughs> normal course. vision through to blindness right. now in between there there's a huge gap where we fill the categories in all right so when someone's measured there's a statutory requirement for driving for occupational tasks and 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 then low vision blindness and so on okay so when someone's eyes are tested um, with and there are two mechanisms of vision. One is we're looking at each other now. When you're at looking at a computer or your phone or concentrating, you're using your visual acuity, your central vision. The rest of the vision, when you're looking straight ahead, is your peripheral vision. Right, left, up and down, right? It's like a donut. Right. Yeah? So there's the two mechanisms. One's more for detail, color, and daytime vision. The peripheral vision, the rest of the retina on your back of your eye, is for nighttime vision, yeah? movement, detection of shadows, black and white vision. So at night, you know, less color vision. So black and white is, is really important. So depth perception, overhead obstacles, things from the right and left, you know, those, those visual um, skills are, are what, what become uh, impaired. So when we're measuring and you're looking at the chart, if you can't read the top letter of the eye chart, with your best well, corrected vision and your, your better eye, your optician would be blind. able to tell you whether you are visually impaired yeah. and to what degree, yeah, and so whether it can be um, certified or. That's right. So uh, visual acuity yes. wise, if you can't read the top letter of the eye chart with your best corrected vision and your better eye, then you're legally blind. Okay. So at six meters, you can't see what someone with normal vision can see at sixty meters, right? Right. Or yeah. Right. Sense? So they'll give you or the twenty and two hundred. So they will measure your vision and okay. give you the statutory clinical diagnosis right. and then if you are got restricted like you mentioned the gentleman who had retinitis pigmentosa right that's a peripheral vision loss the visual acuity might be perfectly intact but slowly the field is shrinking mm -hmm. so if their vision is 10 degrees like looking through a keyhole then you've got severe restriction on your peripheral vision. Okay, so, yeah. um, we are running out of time. Sure. We've almost come to the end of the interview and there's still lots that I did want to unpack with you. One of them being uh, the um, awards or the order that that has been um, conferred on you. Tell us a little bit about that. I think that's big, that's huge. And we're so proud that uh, you, know, you are um, recognized for the work you've done, not only in Australia, but globally. Um, well, it's hard to talk about it, but um, 
In 2009, I, was, I received the Order of Australia Medal, and that's a, a national honour. Um, and so that was for services to people who are blind or vision impaired through advocacy roles and mostly the, the, the things I do outside of my day-to-day -day job. And people, obviously, people that you've worked with had to nominate you for the award. I, I found out, and I'm not supposed to find out, but I found out that I was nominated by a, a group of clients who I'd worked with in the past. And, and it takes, when they've submitted the um, documentation or the, the, the nomination, it takes about two years before they, because they, they call everyone, your teachers, they call people to get the character references. And I was quite surprised, my brother one day was sitting, having um, some tea and he said, oh, I got a call, I, I helped you get that award because <laughs> I spoke to them about you. Oh, <laughs> so wonderful. They did, oh, and, but, but look, it, it, it's, it, it's an honour. We don't do things for awards and things like True. that. And that was um, a, a very pleasant surprise. And, um, but it it's nice. also yeah. a, a yardstick or an indication that what you are doing, you're doing it with heart and soul, you're doing it with passion, and it is making and has made a very positive difference in a whole host of people's lives. Sh sure, Alhamdulillah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, your closing remarks to our viewers this morning. Get your eyes tested. Do not undervalue the gift of sight, hearing, touch and your senses, right? Make sure exercise is important, but remember human rights. If it doesn't start in your heart, in your mind, in your home, right? Then it doesn't matter whether it's legislated by the UN or the South African government. If it doesn't happen at home, it won't work in reality. So you must be part of the solution. Islamically, we have a very, the Quran has all the principles of human rights in there. So let's follow them. Let's make sure that all our members of society, whether they're Muslim or not, everyone, all human beings are valuable. We must look after each other, provide opportunities and be, be, be inclusive of every, be every human being. Be and animals as well. Minded. Look after animals, be respectful to animals. Allah gave us those gifts. So look after them just as much as you would look after your children. And our environment, not forgetting and that. The environment. We have a responsibility and let's be more Muslim in every sense of the word. Absolutely. Thank you so very much for being here. It was lovely talking to you. May all of your efforts in South Africa be richly rewarded. I do hope that you can form meaningful partnerships so that you can share your expertise where it's needed most. May Allah be with you. Salaamu alaikum Wa alaikum to you. salam. That was Bashir Ibrahim talking to us about the work that he's doing. It's about mobility awareness. It's about helping people, trying to get people on track as far as causes, education, and awareness is concerned for visually impaired and blind people, not only in Australia, but all around the world. Thank you for watching this part of the program. And to the sister who called in, you can get hold of Farinaz Waja at Tiba, they're based in Indonesia. And if you can't get hold of her, then the South African Council for the Blind, um, either one of them will definitely point you in the right direction. Thank you for your call. Let's take an ad break. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Welcome back. And it is still Women's Month, but we don't need a Women's Month for us to focus on women's issues and to meet dynamic women who work at grassroots levels, uh, really making a difference in our communities and societies as a whole. And I have two very dynamic women here. They started work a couple of years ago and no doubt have made a huge difference in their communities and of course creating the circles which just grows bigger and bigger and bigger. We're talking about an organization called SAWIT. It is a South African Women in Dialogue and it cuts across all racial and colour lines as well. And we have two of them in the studio with us and they're going to talk about their experiences and just how they are making a difference in communities, very especially underprivileged communities. Abida Khan, Salaamu Alaikum. And Pusaletso, good morning, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. So how did this journey begin for the two of you? You're involved with an organization called SAWID. Let's start with SAWID first. When and how did you hear about the organization? 
We were introduced to it by uh, Auntie Bibi. Right. She had a meeting, or I think it was November 2004. <clears throat> and from there, we decided, you know, we'll go ahead and try it. And it sounded very good because it's open to any woman. It's a woman's movement, right? Uh, Non-partisan, it doesn't matter which political party you belong to or anything like that. As long as you're a woman, you're part of Sawit automatically, right? And you don't have to sign a, a membership or anything like that as yet. They're trying to, but we haven't gotten to that uh, point as yet. So. Uh, that's where we started. And but we prior to that, you were involved in community upliftment in other areas, even in your private capacity. Very small, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, contribution. But with Sawit, we did quite a bit. Then we broadened out to okay. all the other communities as well. Which so is let's really so when and how did you get involved? <coughs> oh, yeah, yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, 2004, uh, I was, I have established a non-profit organization called Banabukamoso Development Center. And uh, by 2004, some of my staff went to the meeting in Lenazia where Auntie Suraya Bibi Khan have invited all women to come and introduce our weed. And day after they says, no, you as the manager, we think that is just your place. We are not going to be able to understand exactly what is happening there. And then I, I that's how I went there. Arriving there, I find Auntie Bibi Suraya. Luckily, or as God will, I did work with Auntie Suraya at the police forum of Lenazia when it was established. And oh wow, is this woman again? Yeah, let's go on. <laughs> and we started there. That's where she explained to us, and the next thing we went to a conference. Okay, what did she explain to you? She she explained to us because she went to the conference firstly where she was invited by the former president's wife, because we are afraid to use the name, but the former President. Tabo Mbeki's uh, yes. wife. Yes, mm -hmm. Mam Mbeki. Mm -hmm. And then when she comes back, she says, women, this is what we all have to do. Because she was also involved with the Beitinur and the other forums, the Eldorado forums. And then she says, now let's see how do we change other women's lives, as some of you have already started. And that's, she explained to us that it's for women to hold hands. Other women's hands. Other women's hands. To, we have to bring them up. Those who are doing nothing, we have to start to talk to them and tell them to, what can we do at the street level? And uh, <clears throat> that's how she, she explained it. That's how it, it's, 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 it's a woman emancipation organization. And when we went to the conference, it was a wow. When we all come back, we feel that now. You felt we, the fire in yes, you. Yes, <laughs> and it, so, so we doesn't need an office, you know. We, we don't need to say we have an office and then we have to work. No, you just call the women in the street. Into your, your home your or into your yard. In your yard, even there in, at the street level. Others will be afraid, I, I cannot go to whose house, but now. We just call women in that way. So we used to say, uh, we are butterflies. You know, the butterflies, when they see the flowers, they all go there. Right. So for us, women are the flowers. And then the information to say, what are you doing? You know what? There's somebody who, who is knitting. Don't you want to learn to knit? You know, that interaction, that's what we... And scale, up, upscaling, upscaling women. Upscaling women. And even the one that, you know, everybody's ignoring says, ah, that one, you know, she's lazy. You have to go there. We are like missionaries. You know, you go and preach the gospel to, to each and every one. You don't say, no, I will talk to that one, not that one. Uh -uh. You talk to each and every woman and the girl child. 
and the boy child. You know, in my child, so it is my what child is, is it, your and child. You've touched on something very important there. Yes. We know we have a lot of social ills and evils in our community. Mm. We know in in the past they used to say it takes a village to raise a child. Yes. It takes that many people to raise a strong child. But we know that both mom and dad, most families are either a child-headed families mm -hmm. or both parents go out to work. Mm -hmm. So the kids are left at their own, you mm -hmm. know, to, to fend for mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. during the day. Mm -hmm. And that's when kids get into trouble. The mm -hmm. girls fall pregnant, mm -hmm. the boys end up doing drugs and all of these unsociable behaviors. Mm -hmm. What sort of messages do you give to the young girl and boy child? We give them the message of each and every adult is your parent. But be careful what kind of a parent is that particular person. Because now you, you can understand the world is no more like before. There are those people who are doing wrong things. And we always tell the young ones that, listen, you have to start to res respect yourself. And when you respect yourself, you respect the adults, you respect other ones, you respect your peers. And you ensure that you look for the good. Don't, don't, don't focus on evil. Focus on the good from a person. And that's how we, we encourage them at the street levels when we talk to the ordinary women. And then as organizations, we ensure that we have this uh, induction. I, I, I used to call it induction. Now, we, just before you talk about induction, you talk to people at street level. Yes. It's not formal, but how and when and how often do you meet and you start talking and inspiring people to get a grip on their lives? They themselves organize the days and then they say, you'll also come to our street and we want the other women to know, you know, they organize it themselves. And the whole block, they, they, they feel that they all want now to come. They come and consult now. They come to my house. Because when I was at the development center, they go there. You know, every day we are going to have three, five women coming and want to understand what is all this about. And then when it comes to young people, they, 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 they have started to bring back the respect. Even, you know, we got the shibins and the taverns, but immediately they see you coming. They start to, you know, they, they hide the things that they, the wrong things, and they will always greet. Mm -hmm. Because now, it starts with me by greeting them. And that's how it went. Okay, let's go to Abida now. Is it different in Laneja and El Dorado Park, or is it a similar background and similar way in which you interact with people? And when we talk about upliftment of women across um, color and obviously religious um, uh, spectrums. Mm -hmm. Do any, at any stage, do these women come there with the expectation that they're perhaps going to get a handout? In the initial stages they did, but then uh, we made them understand that this is just a movement and we're just working towards building up women in the community and We've met some wonderful women that have done some wonderful sterling work on their own little housewives that you would not think would have those skills, you know? And, and the whole idea with Sawid is for, if mm. I have a particular skill, I need to share it. Each one, teach one. Yes. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that way you're upskilling the, the woman and you're making her more independent, mm. yes. more proud about um, what she's able to put on the table, perhaps. Yes. Or that skill that she's learned from you or you or me, yeah. she's able to perhaps become a little more independent. Yes, mm. definitely. Yes. Definitely. Mm -hmm. They've done a lot of that. There's quite a few ladies that have started their own little projects. We've got one of our ladies that started with the old, uh, older people, and she's running a little center there, and they make all sorts of little things to sell. And that also brings the older people together, like, you know, we have a little social thing going on, and they sell anything, bags, they make bags, and all sorts of little things that they could sell, you know. And 
have a little income from that as well, which is wonderful. Okay, let's mm. take an Anne Bray. Mm. I'm talking to Abida Khan and Pusoletso. They are with an organization called SAWED. It's uh, South African Women in Dialogue. It's not about handouts. It's not about collections. It's none of those things that you find other organizations doing. This is just a group of women that get together very informally and try to uplift each other. We'd love to hear from you and what are your thoughts on on Sawit. Let's go for an ad break. We'll be back with you soon thereafter. Pusoletso Madumise and Abira Khan are guests this morning. They're from an organization called Sawit, South African Women in dialogue and they work at grassroots levels. There is absolutely no hierarchy, no fancy offices or any fancy paperwork that gets um, passed around. They work on the streets at grassroots levels and they have and continue making a difference. Now before um, during the ad break, you mentioned something very, very important, and that is working with youth in the time of the xenophobic attacks. Mm. Uh, let's just hold that thought for a minute. Abida, what makes someone like you, or both of you for that matter, mm. uh, give of yourself and get involved with this type of work? I mean, no. there's really nothing in it for you. No, not really. You don't get paid or anything no, of the sort? No, you don't get paid. But Why do you do you get, it? You get pleasure out of it to see people moving forward and achieving, you know, something in their lives that they can perhaps make a little living from. Not a fortune, but at least they can do something. And uh, it makes a difference. And you learn a lot about other people's cultures, you know, and they un understand you better. A lady said to me once, you won't have tea in my house. I said to her, no, why not? She says, no, you people don't. So I said, no, our only restriction is as long as you don't have pork in your house or alcohol, I will have a cup of tea in your house. There's nothing wrong with that. Mm -hmm. We are forbidden from that because We're of religious... We're forbidden to eat that stuff, but it, I can still have a cup of tea yeah, with you. But I said, as long as you don't have that in your house, I can have a cup of tea in your house with pleasure. Mm -hmm. it, doesn't bother me. So, so your work also then helps dispel these type of myths. Yes, exactly, because mm. people have these myths in their heads that you won't eat in their homes because you find them inferior or something. And I said, no, no, it's nothing like that. That is the only two things that we are forbidden from. And if you do have it in your home, I will not feel comfortable to eat in your sure, house, sure. right? But I said, if you don't, so I'll you have a do, cup of tea. you guys at Sawit are responsible for breaking down barriers yes. and building relationships. Mm -hmm. exactly. Alhamdulillah, that's mm -hmm. amazing. Yes. Mm -hmm. Let's talk important. about how active you guys were in the time of the xenophobic attacks. Did you really make a difference? Oh, we did a lot, a lot. Like in Flakontein, we never had that thing. And remember. It, it Why not? Fire. What did you guys do to prevent be, xenophobic be, attacks? Because the women, the mobilization to the women, and immediately there were a group that wanted to start it, and they did know who to consult, and they did know that when we go to Matumise, she's really going to make means. This is not going to happen. And I, I was from a meeting, and I think I was from the conference of Sawit, by the way. It was on our last day when I arrived. And then I find groups on the street and the other women says, oh, there, at least she is, she is back. And then they ask me, hey, there are people there saying they are going to burn these shops and all the foreigners. And, and I said, what are you talking about? They said, yes. And then I went to the group and I asked them, what's wrong here? Yes, these people came here to South Africa. And I, I just take my phone and I say, I'm phoning the police now, and I did, eh? and I phoned the counselor. Within 10 minutes, the stability was there, the police was there, the counselor was there, the other official, uh, community leaders was there, and they dispersed it, and it was done. It, it never ever, ever again. It's they, very they are important. They attacking the, police, uh, the, the Pakistans, the Somalis, but not in Flakfontein. 
<laughs> and now it extended and then because now so we are in region G southern forums South Africa women in dialogue southern forums that's what we called ourselves when we launched it and it was on the 8th of March and we did pass the message that your child is my child your mother is my mother your father is my father we have to respect each other we don't want to know about your color about your nationality but we are a human being we are all africans and the message was spread so clean except at the areas where women are still ignorant because we don't have to run away from that we still have women who feel you know they feel it's me you know and you cannot talk to my child but most of the women in region g they have woken up because now they they see the diversity when we have our activities like when the the princess of belgium the princess ne? yes of belgium came to orange farm and then we invited all women all women and just that little thing has made them to say no we 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 don't have a reason why should we fight each other except the hooligans because the hooligans are still there and this evil behavior of people is there but we really what, feel right what is you've made strides and you've made improvements in a lot of areas Alhamdulillah, you've uplifted women, you've given them skills. As you said, some women are now able to feed their families yes. with the skills they've learned from interacting with you guys. And you're going to continue doing that yes. because I know Auntie Bibi's told me that the organization is growing by leaps and bounds. Yes. And even if you join Sawid and you're not able to do much for anybody else, you as a person in your own mm -hmm. capacity, yes. you yes. are empowered, you're enlightened and you can just make conditions better for yourself and mm -hmm. your immediate family. Mm -hmm. yes. And that is a start and that's a great start. Mm -hmm. yes. But I know that you're reaching out very, very widely. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Pusaleto has just touched on a very crucial issue and that's the issue around hooliganiz uh, mm -hmm. hooliganism. Mm -hmm. yes. We know that that is the reason why we see the huge crime levels, mm -hmm. the house robberies, the mm -hmm. killings, mm -hmm. Um, hijackings, etc., etc., and we also know that that is directly linked to drug abuse. Yes. What is your focus as far as that is concerned? Because if you start at grassroots level, mm -hmm. you know that you're going to make a great impact. Abida, your thoughts? Look, we've tried, you know, with some of the kids, but haven't had a lot of success because in the first place, you're not sure where they are and you're not sure who they are. And people accuse people of things and you're not certain. So you can't go directly up to the person and say, you know, I believe you're taking drugs, you know. So you need to find out a little bit more about that and be very subtle in the whole issue. But you do But, know that you collectively as women have yes. got, um, you, you truly have the power. You can turn the tide. Yes, yeah. You can definitely try, you know, your best as much as you possibly can. But it's very difficult. That's one of the worst, I think, scourges in society is drugs. But What I do think, you think? I, but I think we, we as Saudians, Southern Forums, uh, we, we... I mean, if you could stem the tide of xenophobia, yes, we, then I think if you people start working slowly and surely against this scourge that we can we, overcome... We did already. We did already. They, they, they were drug dealers at... Uh, M.H. Jusup, you know, they were arrested. It doesn't matter they have released. Lately, we, it's a rumor that one of those guys have been released. But we did put on, you know, we stamp on our feet and say, not our children. And we did went to the Lenazia uh, court. We mm. protested there. They were there. And the drug dealers were there. And we are not scared. I mean, it's our children's life. And really, the, the law has taken its course. It did. Because yeah. they were... But 
But you've got to keep persevering. (coughs) Yes. Keep persevering. And I think we need to have stricter laws when it comes to drug dealers. Yes. I think they got off very leniently. Yes. Some of them got two and a half years, the others, Mm. the other one five, and and the other one seven. And apparently they only serve half the term. Mm. So they're out in a hoodwink. Mm -hmm. You know, we couldn't believe that. They were out in the streets again. And okay, we've got to wrap up to now. It. We're almost out of time. Your final words and women and, and, and words of encouragement to women. We can all work together, you know, and we need to understand that we're all human beings, no matter which background or religion or anything that we come from. We can work together. And, and we it, must uplift each other as uplift women. Uplift our own communities, you know, the places where we live, whoever wherever we are, and in that way, we can really make strides in a huge difference. And I think we have to break the barrier of Christianity and... and All religions. All all religions. Mm. We we know the Christians, we've got a tendency of Muslims, and the Muslims also got that tendency. I think if we break that, because already in Saudi we don't have that, and then most so color and religion is what you need to break religion. down. Yes. We have to break down. And we also have to say our government, the policies of our government when it comes to justice, you know, the law, it, 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 it has to, to be tightened very strongly. And our advocates and our lawyers, because they are the ones who are protecting the wrongs. And, and unfortunately, think, that's where we have to leave it. Two <laughs> extremely strong women from Sawi, thank you for coming in, sharing your heart and your thoughts with us this morning. And please go on igniting those other hearts and those other lives. That was Pusaletso and Abida Khan from South African Women in Dialogue, making a difference at grassroots levels. And we pray for them and we pray for the strength Um, and the growth of this organization. We'll be wrapping up in a little while with something truly beautiful and sublime, the lovely Samiha Issa. And welcome back. We're into the final segment of the show this morning. And I did promise that you're in for a treat with something truly beautiful and very sublime indeed. Two beautiful girls in the studio here with me. They've touched my life in a very positive and a very special way. Um, Samia Essa is the girl in question and her mom Anissa is here as well. And I remember going back almost two years ago, Samia was one of my first few interviews and I was so, so, so taken aback with this young little girl that was so filled with talent and just the comfort she gave me by being in the studio and sharing her beautiful voice with us. So let's welcome the two gorgeous girls in the studio. Samia Issa and her mom Anissa. Salaamu alaikum, welcome. Wa alaikum salam. Samia, it's great to have you back in the studio. It's lovely to have you here. You How do you feel being here with me again? I'm really excited. As am I. I'm truly excited to have you. Now, we had a chat a little while ago. In fact, I had the ch- chat with mom, and I wanted you to come and do something special for me on Eid, but that wasn't possible. And mom promised that you'd be here for Eid al Adha. And here you are, you're going to sing a very special song for us. Mm. Now, we, you, you're sharing two songs with us today. Mm. Okay, before we get to the songs, how has life been? It's been really good. I just won the Ilo Art Festival. Oh I'm yes, so congratulations. Thank you so much. And I've met so many different new artists. And yeah. Wow, are you doing any work in the future with the new artists? Gee, I'm doing another song with Tariq Grace Malinga. Oh, mashallah. I can't wait for that. Now, let's share your first song and then which song? You're going to share an Eid song with us, a she. song on Eid adha she. and you're going to share the song with us that your winning song at the Ilm Arts Festival. She. Which one are you doing first? I think I'm going to do the Ilm Arts Festival one first. All right, there you go. You're going to stand up to do the song. She. Okay, what is the song called? Kun Enter. 
there we go. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Li-ujarihim qallatu wa yirama bihim babarautu shakhsan akhar. Okay, sorry, sit down. We can't get you in a full shot. Maaf, let's start again. Si. Li-ujarihim qallatu wa yirama bihim babarautu shakhsan akhar. Kay atafahar. Wa anantu ana anni bidhalika hustu ina. Fawajadtu anni hasir. Fatilka mazaha hir. La 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 hta jamalha. Kay nashtara jamalha. Chauhar na una. Fil kalbika la 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 la. Nur din nasa bimalha. Nur gawlana hala. Mashallah, mashallah. Anissa, it obviously uh, requires a lot of discipline and hard work. It's, you know, Allah's blessed everyone with this particular talent. She, Sami, has been blessed with a beautiful voice. But it doesn't come without hard work and discipline and a lot of support from mom and dad and the rest of the family. Most definitely. Um, Sami has got to be very disciplined. You know, the minute she gets homework, she's got to sit the same day and try and get through as much of it as she can. Um, she loves just listening to new songs, you know, finding new nasheeds, finding new things to sing. You know, we're constantly changing and your taste constantly changes and she's a growing child. So she's constantly trying to find new material and in particular for the Ilm Arts, she had to sing something, a cover song. Right. So somebody else's music. So uh -huh. it was quite an intense procedure and she did all the groundwork by herself and eventually she was like, I've got the song, you know, listen to it and tell me what you think. Uh -huh. And um, Alhamdulillah, she's, Allah has blessed her. Amin, so. Amin, Tumma Amin. I remember I bumped into you on that day and you told me that she has entered the competition and you told me also that the talent is so great that you didn't think she stood a chance. And then later when I met you, you told me that she'd actually, or I think we had on a phone call, you told me that she had won. So congratulations once again. Exactly. What does that win mean for you? So that win uh, allowed me to perform at the show later that night with all the other artists like Erisal Ali, um, Mohammed Yasin Mohammed and Rashid Bika. And that also means lots of work with other artists, joint work, collaborations with other artists. Are you hoping, inshallah, one day to go overseas and go and uh, you know go to all these nasheed shows all around the world, she, Malaysia, UK? She, inshallah. When's that going to happen? I'm hoping this year sometime. Okay, okay. Um, Let's, this is now our Eid special. Eid is on Friday, inshallah. Lots of du'as that everybody, families all around the world have a wonderful Eid al-Adha. And of course, our loved ones that are in the holy, hand, uh, lo, holy lands performing Hajj, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for them and accept all of their du'as. So are you ready for your next song? Bismillah. Ya hubbana. أسنتنا وجمعت الشملنا أنت هدية من الله لنا فعتت علي لك طول السنة فيك السرور والحنا همد لك يا ربنا إير مصاي Let's enjoy this happy day إذا مبارك ما Celebrate, celebrate, and celebrate. Allah, Allah, thank you for this day. Feeling so good, smiles and greetings everywhere. Eid al Mubarak to everyone out there. Whole families together and celebrate. Today's the day, so come on, no time to waste. Sometimes the world takes us so far, the miles apart. Today you're in my heart, 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 heart. I'm tired, let's enjoy this happy day. Eid al Mubarak, come on, let's celebrate, celebrate, let's celebrate. Allah, Allah, thank you for this day. Jazakallah. 
Mashallah, what a beautiful Eid present. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. Exactly. Now, the last time you people were here, I know I heard about another album that was on the cards. How far down the line are we with that? Um, actually, we haven't started. We're going to be starting soon, like, I think. In a it's a lot of work, is it not? Why? Oh, and my mother has to answer that question. <laughs> I think, you know, we've, you know, for the first year and a bit, we were so busy with shows every, almost every weekend that there wasn't time to sit and write and reflect. And we've, uh, just before Ramadan, she released a, a single with Tariq Malinga called Salam Un Salam. Um, it's available on her CD Baby page as well as on Tariq's album. And uh, we, we've just started now back with the producer and inshallah, we're hoping that by end of next year or so that we'd have another album ready, inshallah. And this is her first album, which is right, Your Passage of Time. You actually wrote all the songs, did you not? She had did. I, I think that's amazing. So I can see the talent runs throughout the family. Mm -hmm. What sort of material are you busy working on uh, for the next album? You know, this time round, we haven't actually chosen a theme. Um, in fact, Samiha has been choosing the type of, the type of, um, beats and the type of, you know, the the speed of the music and all of that, she's been choosing that this time round. And we're trying to focus a little bit more on things that are pertinent to her age group of children. So things that they are exposed to. So um, which makes sense, because that is as much as we as adults appreciate her beautiful voice and the type of songs she renders, she also needs to uh, she needs to identify so she can be more passionate about it. Yes. And also, you know, at their age, they are faced with so many challenges. Oh, true. And they need role models. So we're trying to look at, you know, the they are, they've been such great Muslimas throughout the world and over time. So we're looking at their life stories and trying to gain inspiration as to what we can take out of their lives and impart it to others through Nasheed. Inshallah. Inshallah, alhamdulillah for that. I, I just think it's amazing. You are truly blessed to have such a gifted child. Every every child comes as a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and every child comes with something special. But I always say that a singing voice is truly an extraordinary gift. So do Just embrace it with all you have. We're going to close off now. What would you like to say to everybody watching us today? Um, uh, Eid Mubarak to everyone, and I hope you have a lovely, blessed Eid. Mashallah. Anissa, your closing thoughts? I would like to wish everyone gone for Hajj, an accepted Hajj, uh, including my brother and all the crew that are of out course. there. Yeah, I'd like to wish everyone a Hajj Makbul and Mag Hajj Makbrur, and, you know, I pray that everybody has a lovely day, and, you know, please remember us all in your du'as. Ameen, Thuma, Ameen. And that brings us to the end of the show. And the moment Hajj is mentioned, I, my eyes just well up with tears. And of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant each and every hujaj, Hajj Mabul, Hajj Mabrur, inshallah. And don't forget, we um, have our Hajj special, which is being beamed out uh, throughout this coming week. I will be with you on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday morning from 10 to 11 with memories of of the Hajj. So don't forget to join me then. And of course, all the other crossings over to the Holy Lands and all the other special Hajj programs that we have for you. So keep tuned to ITV for the bumper special, the bumper Hajj special. Till Monday morning at 10 o'clock, it is Khoda Hafez from me, Julie Ali, and a big thank you to the Let's Talk production team. Ya hala, ya hala, ya hala. Ya hello, 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 ya hello